Good morning. Wonderful to have all of you with us and uh, all those watching. This is our live stream of our 1030 Contemporary Service here at Summit of Peace Lutheran Church. I'm Jeremy Jacoby, senior pastor here. I'll be leading you in worship along with Pastor P.J. Stolman and then uh, sharing a message from God's Word today is Pastor Mark Jansen. He's actually sharing it in our sermon series entitled Reopening Christianity. And today we look at, am I known for what I am for or against? And I know it'll be a blessing for us. A couple of things to remind you of as well. We've got a praise team here and on stage today leading us Big Daddy Ty and DCE Diva. Is that yeah. the stage name yeah, you've DCE decided Diva. when you're singing? Do you like it or not? What do you think? Okay, well, we're mixed reviews at the moment, but at least uh, thanks for sharing your gift in that way. Reminder that our children's message has been pulled out of our service, uh, and that's on our Facebook page. You can find that um, already up there. It went up at 9.15, so watch that with the family. It'll be a blessing to you. Uh, as always, you can submit prayer requests if you're watching our live stream in the comment section. Those will be communicated to us. You can do it anytime up through the time of the offering. And we'll make sure to include those in our prayers. And then for those who uh, are here with us live, uh, we'll take those as verbal requests at the time of prayers as well. I don't think we have any other announcements. Why don't we prepare hearts by standing? And uh, we will begin, as always, remembering the name into which we were baptized, the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. When the 
We'll have our gospel reading uh, now from John chapter 8, starting with verse 2. Early in the morning, Jesus came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what are you saying? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, from now on, sin no more. The Gospel of the Lord. Please join me in prayer. Lord Jesus, we know if all of our sins would be revealed, we'd be like this woman in our gospel reading, caught, afraid, deserving of punishment. We thank you, Lord, that instead of dealing with, with us because of our sins, you deal with us according to your grace. As you showed the woman grace, you show us grace and forgiveness. But we confess, Lord, that too often we view ourselves and others through judgmental eyes and condemning eyes instead of your eyes and your heart. And so, Lord, all those weaknesses, all those people groups, all those things in our lives that have triggered us to pick up stones, we lay them down before you. We pray that you would give us your grace and your compassion. And instead of rushing in to judge someone, we would be quick to show your mercy. Any specific sins, Lord, we now lay before you on the silence of our hearts. We pray, Lord, that you would empower us to lay down our stones and instead pick up your cross. The world might know you 
as our Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, instead of Jesus being the one to throw the stones, he was the one to take the stones intended for us. And that's what he did when he died and suffered on the cross for all of our sins and the punishment we deserve. It's because of that today I can declare to you that forgiveness of all of your sins. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Continue our worship with our Old Testament reading from Deuteronomy chapter 14. At the end of three years, you shall bring out all the tithe of your produce in the same year and lay it up within your towns. And the Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance with you, and the sojourner, the fatherless, the widow, who are within your towns, shall come and eat and be filled. That the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands that you do. Word of the Lord. Our epistle reading today comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 
I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world, or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother, if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed, or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a person. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? This is the word of the Lord. Continue our worship with confessing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Jesus, friend of sinners, we have strayed so far away. We cut down people in your name, but the sword was never ours to swing. Jesus, friend of sinners, the truth becomes so hard to see. The world is on their way to you, but they're tripping over me. Always looking around, but never looking up. I'm so double-minded. A plank-eyed saint with dirty hands and a heart divided. Oh, Jesus, friend of sinners, open our eyes to the world at the end of our pointing fingers. Let our hearts be led by Help us reach with open hearts and open doors. Oh, Jesus, friend of sinners, break our hearts for what breaks yours. Jesus, friend of sinners, the one who's riding in the sand. May the righteous turn away and the stones fall from their hands. Help us to remember we are all the least of these. Let the memory of your mercy bring your people to their knees. Nobody knows what they're for, only what they're against when they judge the wounded. What if we put down our signs, crossed over the lines, and loved like you did? Oh, Jesus, friend of sinners, open our eyes to the world at the end of our pointing fingers. Let our hearts be led by mercy. Help us reach with open hearts and open doors. Every lost cause, you love every outcast. For the leper and the lame, they're the reason that you came. Lord, I was that lost cause, I was the outcast. But you died for sinners just like me, a grateful leper at your feet. You are good. 
and open doors. Oh, Jesus, friend of sinners, break our hearts for what breaks yours. Thank you for that. Thank you for that song. I, th I think my mic, is my mic on? No, okay. Thank you for that song. Um, almost to the point where, well, you heard the sermon. We can go now. Uh, Katie, you picked that? Where's Katie? That, did you pick that? Yes. Very good. Very good. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for, that you have called us to this time and place at this moment in time. We thank you, Jesus, that you poured out your love and your forgiveness and your grace into our lives and have allowed us to take that into the world. Help us to love, Lord, everybody in our life, no matter who we encounter. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Oh, these things do get hot. Um, before we begin, uh, I'm Pastor Mark. I um, recently moved here. <laughs> in December of last year and uh, visited quite a few areas, uh, quite a few churches in the area. And, um, and then my daughter moved from Memphis, Tennessee to Atlanta, uh, I think on like the 16th or 17th of March. <laughs> and she says, find a church for me, Dad. And um, my son lives in another area of this state, believe it or not. And then... Um, I just came, moved here from Wisconsin. So over the last three months, I've had an opportunity to look at a lot of churches. I mean, easily seven, eight here in the greater uh, Thornton, Denver area, and another seven or eight in the Atlanta area, and then my home congregation and three or four of the churches there. So what was that, like a dozen and a half? And of all of those churches, Pastor Jacoby and Summit of Peace are doing it best. You know? Yeah. You know, like... It. Yeah. And uh, I think Pastor Jacoby and you guys uh, and all the support staff, whoa, whoa, whoa. I mean, uh, man, you should take this on the road. Well, may maybe not now. <laughs> But certainly, you know, I'm telling all my pastor friends, you know, you need to look at this church, you need to look at their website, look at their Instagram, uh, Facebook page, look at us on Sunday morning, look at how we post it on our pages. It's just a superb job. So, uh, and I'm glad that I'm joining here. Really am. So, let's get to the sermon. Uh, and I usually set a timer here so I don't go like way over. Okay, should we do about 16 minutes, 15? 16, 17? Yeah, I'm, I'm willing. <laughs> okay, sermon title. Am I known for what I am for or against? What, what, what am I for or against? Um, figured I'd kind of massage that. What are some other ways of saying that? What do I cheer and what do I boo? And to give you an illustration, let's try this one. Denver Broncos. Okay. Kansas City Chiefs. <laughs> There's always one in every crowd. <laughs> and let me tell you, being from Minnesota and spending the last 15 years in Wisconsin, I know what it is to be the only one. So, okay, uh, how about this? What do you just, when someone says, let's go out to eat, ah, uh, you know exactly what you want. Yeah? You know, like two or three things, yeah. What will never appear on your plate? Do you know that? Do your friends, do your family know that? Yeah. If you ever have me over, you see me out and want to buy me something, never. Green olives with pimentos, never. I worked in a food factory where I had to grind pimentos and I had to throw them down a chute and grind them up into little pieces 
and there's supposed to be a shield on it, and there was, but I come for break time, and I'm like red mark, red, from head to toe, up my nose, in my ears. I've never liked pimentos since then. I can smell them, literally. I can walk into a house, and I can literally say, you got pimentos in this house. You got green olives with, black, with red pimentos in the refrigerator. How did you know? Once you get it up your nose, you'll never forget it. Of course, most of us work, so you have your favorite employee. Yeah? Favorite person? Maybe in the neighborhood, favorite neighbor? Yeah? Favorite teacher if you're in school? Yeah? Mm -hmm. And then you have your neighbor you like to avoid, like the pan pandemic. You got that employee that you just cringe. So see, we all have things in our life that we're for and against, that we cheer and that we boo, that we like and not so much. So let's, uh, hopefully this sermon will help you clarify how as a Christian you can be for something and maybe against something else. So let's uh, start off here. Let's start, what's Paul against? I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with the sexually immoral people. Great. Great. Let's talk about immoral people. That's kind of like the go-to subject for Christian pe preachers. We can all agree to be against people that are sexually immoral. And in fact, this past week, I turned on one of my Christian radio stations, <laughs> and sure enough, there's the preacher, preaching against all, all the sexual immorality in the world. And I'm thinking, and I've thought this for a number of years, why don't we talk more about the goodness of sex, the goodness of love, the goodness of sexual relationships, the greatness of sexuality. And like I'm already seeing some of the eyes of the older people going, no, no, don't go there. You see the parents of the like pre-adolescents or young adolescents, pastor, pastor, we haven't had that talk yet. <laughs> and my wife is going, no, you didn't tell me you were going to say that. So it's obvious that Paul is against the misuse the misuse of your sexuality, okay? We can say sexually immoral, and that's, you know, that, but misuse of your sexuality. I am, I too am against the misuse of your sexuality, but I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on that. At least I don't want to, at least I fail to tell you what I am for, which is kind of the first clue and the first step to where we're going. Let's go on to verse 10 of Paul to the Corinthians. I did not mean, and, and I'm reading this from God's Word translation. Uh, it's a translation put together by some Lutherans in the la last part of the last century and the first part of this century. Try to make it more readable, more understandable to the 21st century ear. And I, too, have even adapted it because it's not always perfectly clear. Uh, what Paul says, I did not mean the sexually immoral of this world. And what he's referring to is the people outside of these walls of Christianity. I'm not talking that, uh, I did not mean the sexually immoral out there. What I'm talking about, or the greedy, the swindler, idolatrous, since then you would need to go out or leave the world. And this is kind of an important uh, part, and let's uh, put this in the positive. Let's put this in the positive. Paul is saying you may live life in the world, outside of these walls, and have social relationships with whomever you wish. Okay? That's the positive sense of what Paul is saying. Is that the people outside these walls, go ahead, have a social relationship with them, engage them in conversation, talk with them. Don't be like my distant relatives the Mennonites, and the Amish. My, my grandfather, Jansen, was a Mennonite, um, as was all his relation. Part of my mother's relations were Mennonites. And while they were not the ultra-conservative, they did not much engage the world. They were kind of their own community, and certainly the Amish today have isolated themselves from the greater culture. And Paul is saying, don't do that. Don't isolate yourself from out there. Rather, go out there 
and that's clue two. Because you may need to take what you learn in here out there. Next verse, next verse. But now I'm writing to, te- writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother, anyone who is a fellow member of the body of Christ here. Don't associate with anyone who bears that name and is guilty of sexual immorality, greed, is an idolater, reveler, drunker, or swindler. That's important. Not even to eat with such a one. Oh boy. Oh boy. You hear what Paul's saying? What he's against? My first call uh, 25 years ago was to a remote rural congregation in Oklahoma. Uh, My home congregation in that time in Dublin, Ohio, had paid to Gail a salary to stay home with our kids and to support our family so that I could go to seminary. At that time, 25 years ago, $60,000 was the the amount that they, well, was quite a bit over $60,000. So that when I graduated from seminary, and the seminary says, we're, we're, you know, what's your debt? I mean, that was the first question. Was that the first question to you? Yeah, the first que- was it still the first question, PJ? Uh, the first question, you're graduating from seminary, and the first question they ask you is, how big is your debt? Meaning, how rich of a congregation do we need to send you to? You know, so they come to me, you know, how big is your debt? Don't have one. And the... And the and Groudon, Groudon, was it still, no? Pastor Groudon, who has been there for like 30 years when I graduated, looks at me and he goes, really? Yeah. I had such a loving, caring congregation back in Dublin, Ohio. They, they paid me to go to seminary. Wow. And he shuffles some papers, he shuffles some papers, and he says, great. Would you like to go to a rural congregation? And Gail and I look at each other. Yeah, you know, we had family out on the farm. And he goes, and we go, yeah. And he goes, really? Wonderful. What do we do now? You know, well, we're done here. No more interview? No, we have like 20 congregations I want you. Ah! So I end up in rural Oklahoma, in the Bible Belt, in the Bible Belt. And I got to know everybody in town. It was only a town of 1,100 people half the size of my last congregation. Went out to coffee three times a week, got to know all the guys in, in town, all the, uh, the bankers, the, the lawyer, uh, the co-op manager, all the big farmers of which several belong to my congregation. Got to know all the pastors in town real, real well. One day the school superintendent came to talk to us pastors in rural Oklahoma in the Bible Belt. And he wanted to know if he could have our help that we'd all like to preach on something. What do you want us to preach? And he says, well, he says, I got a problem. We got a problem in high school. He says, we got people stealing things. We got people getting drunk, coming back on the bus from sporting events. And man, we just have way too many pregnant pregnant girls in high school. So, okay. We'll get back to you on that. So as pastors, you know, talked, and we found out, oh, just to let you know that there were 25 kids, 25 students per grade level. So we're talking in the high school, what, 100 kids, 100. Is that, was that a small? Would you call that small? Yeah, that's small. So you know everybody in town. So as pastors got together and we said, well, those 20, those 100, 100 kids, how many come to church? The Baptist preacher says, oh. What do you mean coming to church? And I go, good grief, what do you want? Once a quarter? Yeah, sure. Of those 100 kids in the Bible Belt of rural Oklahoma, 20 of them, 20% were in any church on at least once a quarter basis. Hmm. Us pastors did a little bit more research and looked a little bit more at those 20 kids who came to our churches and we found out that, uh, that the stealers, the thieves, were in that 20. 
I had some of the drunks, some of the kids who snuck the alcohol on the team buses were in that 20. And then even a couple of the girls that went to our churches were the pregnant ones. If I were to take Paul's advice, could you throw that last frame up there? Last, uh, not even to eat with such a one. What would have been my reaction to that news and to our behavior? Was I not to associate with the high school students in my own congregation? Or any of the high, other high schoolers? And I had to ask myself seriously, seriously, what would Jesus do? And that's your third clue, and that should be a big clue. Paul ends his discussion with a seemingly shocking suggestion. Here's the next from the next verse. For what I what have I to do with judging outsiders, those people outside the congregation? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? Holy moly, you gotta be kidding me. We're gonna judge uh, people who sin in the church, who are all that big long list, immoral, swindlers, idolaters, and all that kind of stuff. And unfortunately, the church for a long time, for many years, has done exactly that. Maybe it's time to change. Maybe it's time to take this chance to step away from the church, to stay at home, to think about how am I going to come back? How are we going to come out of this pandemic? How are we going to show what the church really is? The church for years has used that as a reason to kick people out of church, or I suppose the modern word is to ghost to ghost people. Thank you for whoever told me that a few weeks ago, months ago. Which brings us to the old guys. The old guys. Are there any old guys here? Yeah, there's one. Only one old, well, two old guys here now. In the gospel reading. Did you hear about them? Do you remember what the old guys? Yeah. We're all familiar with the story. A woman is caught in, caught, caught in adultery, meaning having sex with somebody who's not her husband. And the guys who bring trot her out in front of Jesus say that, oh, according to the Old Testament, we should stone her to death. So the gathered stone throwers asked Jesus, what should we do? It was a test to see if he would agree with the Old Testament or whether he wouldn't. Jesus gives a rather simple answer, and I'm going to paraphrase it and put it in 21st century language. Yeah, sure, go ahead, stoner. And the first person who's never sinned that way, be the first one to throw the stone. Remember what Jesus said about sexuality and about sex and everything? He says, it's not just adultery, it's just not the act. It's even thinking about the act. It's even thinking, I wonder what sex with her or him would be like. It's even, I hate my wife, I wish I had a different one. That's even wrong. And that you can go to hell for. And he bent down, kept drawing in the dirt. And when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. Those of you who are under 40, under 50 even, the older you get, and certainly those under 20, under 30, the older you get and the more chance you have to look back at what you've done in life, the more you understand how much you've sinned in the past. I mean, what's going on in our culture right now about our past, it's nothing new. It's nothing new. I remember, I vividly remember my first call to a nursing home. Uh, I was a director of Christian education, and my pastor asked me to go to a nursing home because he couldn't stand nursing homes. 1985, went into a nursing home and to visit this member of the church. Oh, I'm done. So, okay, we'll have to say amen. Okay, let's go. Okay, I'm sorry. So I go into a nursing home, 1985, and I asked for whatever her name was, Oh, she's down there, and the nurse says, in fact, here she comes. And this lady was walking down the 
and I can't remember the husband's name, but I'll just say Alfred. Alfred! Alfred! Because I, I knew that was her husband's name. And a nurse comes up to her, takes her by the shoulders and says, Alfred's dead! Don't you remember? And she starts crying. That was called reality therapy. And that's what they were taught in nursing homes in 1985. To help people with Alzheimer's, you tried to get them into the current reality. Was that wrong? Absolutely. Should we repent that we did that? Absolutely. So how did I preach in Oklahoma? How did I preach in Oklahoma? Us pastors got together and <laughs> two of them were going to just bring down fire and brimstone on the teenagers. Ooh, I think back about that, I just, I just shudder. I wonder if the kids ever came back to their church. Now, this is kind of how I preached it. Boy, am I glad I'm not a teenager in today's world. Boy. And if it was true and that was, that was 96 or 97, that was true then. It is even more true in 2020. Man. There are so many more opportunities to get into trouble. Now, I wasn't the perfect student in high school. Okay, let's be more accurate. I wasn't the worst one. Okay? There were a couple that were worse than me. I can't imagine the social media and having every person in every party that I ever attended, having a camera on them and being posted instantly. I am so glad. I am so glad I did not suffer the consequences of my sins. Man, did that give me a forgiving heart towards teenagers, like in a huge way. We forgive our past. We keep, forgive our present to my kids, who are now 34 and almost 30, as they grew up, I told them, as we debated what to be for and what to be against, what we should do, what we should not do. And I told them, you know, in, in 15 or 20 years when we find out that I had you or do something that you weren't supposed to do or you didn't let you to do or whatever, you have to tell me and I'll apologize and you'll have to forgive me. And in fact, since becoming adults, uh, both of them at least a couple of times have said, Dad, remember when you did this in junior high or high school? Yeah, well, you want to know the rest of the story. I'm sorry that I made that decision. But you want to know what they did, have done more? They've thanked me more for setting boundaries to saying, this is how we behave as Christians. This is what we do in a loving, caring family and in friendships. The next slide. In our relationship to the outside world and to each other in the church, we have a choice. There's a choice. One choice is to never, never, ever challenge anybody about their life. Just to keep living and just stay quiet. Don't say anything. Never to make a comment when someone says something racist or sexist or derogatory of the sexuality or does something derogatory of a class or a group of people. We can just be quiet and just don't say anything. We can decide just to quietly, silently stand by and do nothing. And the other choice is the Jesus choice, is to live life in the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. That when someone in your life, at work, in school, or the neighborhood messes up, you can forgive them. Show them compassion and care. Be kind to the victims of sexual, sexuality misuse. Be kind to those people that we like to push to the edges. Be kind to the people that are spoken evil of. When a dirty joke is said, just kind of in a bafflement goal. That's an interesting perspective. That's not the way my God has taught me to look at that. 
when any particular race or class of people are shamed. That's not my God. My God accepts everyone, even someone caught in adultery. The poor people, the prostitutes, the filthy rich, they're all included in God's family. You have a choice. Be for rock throwing or be for giving. Let's close with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we leave this time and place and engage the world, let us help us, Lord, to change our life, our thinking, our actions, our words. Help us, Lord, to engage the world with your forgiveness, your kindness, your compassion to everyone, that nobody is outside of your care. Help us, Lord, not to judge those outside. Help us, rather, to bring your love, compassion, and forgiveness to those people. In all of our ways, Lord, guide us and forgive us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Um, just wanted to uh, give you a couple, uh, uh, talk a little bit about today's generosity moment. We actually give thanks for everyone's generous donations that allowed us to purchase the equipment we need for our uh, continuing the live stream as uh, we move forward, people gathering in the building. Uh, now, when I say to, to purchase it, we have purchased it, we've ordered it, but it turns out that every other church in the world has also started doing this. So we're actually still waiting for quite a bit to be delivered and things like that, but we still give thanks uh, for your generosity uh, overflowing into our lives so that it can flow into the lives of others. With that, we continue with our offering. In the darkness, we were waiting without hope, without light. Till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes. To fulfill the law and prophets, to a virgin came the word. From a throne of endless glory, to a cradle in the dirt. Praise the despise the cross for even in your suffering you saw to the other side knowing this was our salvation Jesus for our sake you
Please stand as we go to the Lord in prayer. Do we have any uh, prayer requests from anyone here today? No, then let us pray. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for another opportunity to gather to worship, to receive your gifts, but also to be reminded that because of our our sinful hearts, our our broken natures, we oftentimes lead with judgment. And that the, the searching of your word and your spirit in our hearts would reveal that oftentimes we do that in order to feel better about ourselves, to justify ourselves. But when your word is is turned in our hearts and we're honest and we see our brokenness, our, our sin, our shame, Lord, we give thanks for such a gracious God, that you are God who is indeed for us and forgiving, that, that has sent his own son to the world to rescue and to redeem each and every one of us. We pray, Lord, that that same spirit, that same heart would be ours as we look to those around us, those who continue to be caught in their brokenness and shame. Lord, we pray that you'd bless us not only as individuals, as your community of faith, but the church throughout the world. That as time goes by, more and more people begin to think of Christians as they think of you, leading with love, peace, and forgiveness. Pray that you, Lord, that you'd bless us to that end. With that in mind, Lord, we lift up those who need you this day. We remember particularly our prayer families. We ask that you be with the Perbeck family, the Peterson family, the Phillips family, and the Porter family. We pray for our sister church resurrection in the city. We give thanks that after searching for um, many years, uh, they have extended a call to a pastor who has um, accepted it. We pray that you would uh, bless them and the calling of Pastor Meisner and his family uh, moving here to continue to serve them, bless them in their ministry. We pray for the faculty and students of Horizon High School. Uh, that even in the midst of uh, the summer and, and the resuming activities, that you would um, bless them and bless our, our work and witness among them. We pray that you especially be with Trenton, who is a police officer at such a difficult time. We ask your peace and protection um, every time he goes out to serve on our behalf. We pray that you would be with Jody. Uh, pray that her left side will return to normal uh, following her stroke. We give thanks, Lord, for 36 years of marriage to Pam and Ryan. Lord, we ask that the continued years of blessings would be theirs uh, in plenty. Continue prayers, Lord, also on behalf of Martha, uh, dealing with issues um, from her cancer and treatment. Lord, we commend her and all uh, into your care. Lord, we lift them up, um, eager to do so because of what we know and what we're reminded of again this day, that we have a God who is not only for us, but forgive me, seeking to do all that is necessary to rescue and to redeem us. For this, we give you thanks and praise, and we do it in the name of Jesus, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Jesus, Lord of my salvation, Savior of my soul, send me out to the world to make you known. Jesus, King of every nation, this world's only hope, send me out to the world to make you known. Send me out to the world. I want to be your hands and feet. I want to be your voice every time I speak. I want to run to the ones in need. In the name of Jesus, I want to give my life away. All for your kingdom's sake. Shine a light in the darkest place. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus.
Carry to the brokenhearted mercy you have shown. Send me out to the world to make you known. To the ones in need of rescue, lead me, I will go. Send me out to the world to make you known. Send me out to the world. I want to be your hands and feet. I want to be your voice every time I speak. I want to run to the ones in need. In the name of Jesus, I want to give my life away. All for your kingdom's sake. Shine a light in the darkest place. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Fantastic as always. Thanks, uh, our praise team, for sharing your gift with us today. Maybe seated, and uh, we pray our service today was a joy and a blessing to you.